All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are we all doing? Good. Good. It's a little windy, but that's okay. No rain. So I don't think it's supposed to rain. So don't be thinking. Don't be. Don't be looking up. You don't need to. It's okay. It's good to see everybody. If if you weren't here. A few nights ago, Thursday night, we had an awesome time here. We had a barbecue, we had some gospel singing, lots of food. Um, and all that being said, there's lots of food. So actually after, if you're hungry, we're going to have some corn, some hot dogs. I think there's some chips and some pop. It's going to be on the back. There's some uh, tables already set up left to right, like you're reading. And then there's also going to be some corn you can buy if you want. Uh, $5 for a dozen. But anyways, this is not announcement time. I think our worship team is up here ready to go. Um, this is just a great time we can be in the presence of the Lord, wherever we are, He is. But sometimes there's something about a community when we can kind of be as a body of believers outside. Great worship. This is a good, a good scenario we can be in. So let's enjoy this worship service. Good morning, Pangrove. How are we today? Let's uh, pray that the rain holds off. So far, so good. Let's uh, let's start by opening up in uh, singing "Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus."
Father God, I just give you all the glory right now, God. I just thank you for how powerful your name is, that at the sound of your name, kingdoms will bow down. God, I just uh, pray for your presence this morning. I just pray that you would show up, that you would touch us this morning, God. Um, and I just uh, thank you for holding off the rain and uh, for just allowing us to worship you freely this morning. In your name I pray, amen. On there we go. Uh, so welcome. If uh, you weren't here when I first started this morning, thank you for coming to Pine Grove. If you're new, we would have lots of people here. I'd love to tell you how good this place is, right? Kind of, yeah. Okay, yeah, good. There you go. Um, and if you missed it, I I talked about an announcement about we got some food after here, some corn, some hot dogs. It'll be in the backside there. There's Donna there just preparing, like she always does. Uh, <laughs> There's also corn you can buy, uh, $5 for a dozen, I believe. Um, also, Mary let me know that we have, our daily breads are in. Uh, we got a large print, print, or a large font, and then a regular size one. It's for October, November, and December, I believe. So if you want some of those, go see Mary. We're gonna get ready for our prayer time. Um, our prayer time, we love it. There's no rules, no regulations, no restriction, no certain way to do this, no magic genie bottle rubbing type of scenario. Um, this is just an amazing time that you can have with encounter with God. And I would, I would just say, I mean, this might be a little too much, but you aren't confined to your chair either way. So if you want to get up or walk around, we've got tons of space here. You're more than welcome to do that. Um, but this is just a special time between you and our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> There's going to be some music on in the background, but that music is to get your hearts going. Um, and I think Jesus wants to tell you something really special today that means very much to you personally. So, Kira. Yeah. 
running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Don't my life be weapon faithful. Don't my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, and I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's sing that one more time. Oh God, you've been oh so faithful, and oh God, you are so, so good. May our voices ring out of all that you are, all that you have been, and all that you will be. Oh Lord, what a privilege it is to stand in the presence of a faithful God. One who carries us when we are weak. One who runs alongside us when we are strong. Oh, you are faithful. Lord, you are faithful to meet each and every need. You're able to keep that which we've committed unto you until that great and glorious day of Jesus. When the trumpet sounds and the clouds are rolled back and we hear the triumphant trumpet blast, then you will gather your faithful. Oh God, make us faithful. Make us faithful as you are faithful. Teach us, oh God, to seek first your kingdom and all your righteousness, knowing that you will take care of all the rest. Oh, we give you praise and we give you glory this morning for who you are. We bring each and every need before you, each and every care, each and every burden, and we lay them at your feet. God, we bring you those beautiful folks in Haiti who have suffered so much. And we pray, oh God, that you would deliver them from their troubles and that you would help us draw us close to you as you are drawing them close to you. God, we pray for the country of Afghanistan, all those who are in bondage, persecution. May they know the love of the Lord Jesus. And Father, we pray for this body here called the Pine Grove. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would use us today and in the years to come. Lord, we continue to ask that you would bring a Pentecost at Pine Grove. That your spirit would fall upon us and the young men would have visions and old men dream dreams. Oh, God. You 
are the faithful one for which we are truly, truly thankful. All right, I'm back. Loud. How's that sound? A little better? A little better. I'm uh, I'm so used to being in the hockey net and, and everyone being up on the sides in the air, and now I'm actually above you guys. It's actually, yeah, it's, I don't I know, I can name someone that's <clears throat> I'm married that might like this scenario more than me, but it's all right. I'll give you still looking. I'm not, I might be looking down on you, but I'm, I'm not. I'm just pretty sure. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, I, everything Dan prayed is just, is so right for what's just, what's going to come out of my mouth. It's what I've been thinking about, it's been what I've been wrestling with and chewing about, chewing on. Sometimes it's it's so hard to <laughs> put words on paper with with the, the type of experience I've been having with you just this this week, but... Holy Spirit, speak through me to the hearts of everyone here. It's going to be a message that we all need to hear, and we all need to be reminded of, and it's a good one. Meet everyone where they're at today. Help us just to understand that there's no greater moment than the moment we're in right now. Our bodies can be here, but sometimes our minds and our hearts could be somewhere else. I pray that our whole self is here right now in this moment. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen. All right. If I would ask, if I would ask you, uh, yeah. Also, I, I gotta make sure I stick to my my notes here because there's a lot going on. Um, if I'd ask you, what gives you rest? What what kind of comes to your mind? You can think about it. You can shout something out if you want. I might be holding this mic. Heck, then. There we go. Rest. Uh, what gives us rest? Naps. Naps give you rest. They give me rest. I'm probably going to have one this afternoon, maybe. Um, sometimes people like to go to maybe amusement, park, amusement, amusement parks as a rest. Uh, vacations for rest, uh, playing video games as rest. I don't get to do that as much now that I have a whole bunch of kids, but I enjoyed doing that when I was in college. Um, maybe they, some people view Sunday as rest, doing something fun. Sometimes people pick jobs or certain careers that offer you vacation time, like lots of vacation time. Um, in that way, they know they can have a little rest penciled in, and paid rest is probably greater. Our, our world maybe finds these, these things uh, for rest, in, in physical rest. Uh, our world has also tried to think of some ways that we understand there's kind of um, a spiritual part of rest that we need to try to figure out. A spiritual type of rest, so they kind of go to some yoga and some meditation. Um, for, and I'll just say, like, the word meditation actually came from the Bible, meditate on the God's word may, uh, day and night. And Eastern meditation, when you think of now of meditation, it means just to empty oneself out, being totally empty and um, being one with the universe. And with that comes all these weird assumptions. But the biblical word of meditation means actually to fill oneself oneself up. But the world, right, they try to figure out, okay, I need some rest mentally, so we need to totally figure out how we can empty ourselves, empty our minds. So I, the world's trying to figure out rest, how they can have rest. I always find it funny, um, and I, I've experienced it. I probably said it too. We we have we might go away on a vacation and have rest, but what's everyone say when they come back to work? And the reality of it, I I could use another vacation, or I could use another day. Uh, the point is, there's something deep inside of us that we need rest. And in our world, we we're trying to find out where that is. 
We have a deep desire for rest, to take a break from this chaotic world we live in, to be replenished, to be restored. And there are certainly practical ways, and there are ways that we should put into practice in our life, like taking naps. <laughs> Uh, but the Bible tells us about a story about where this restlessness came from. Because we were never created to live with this restlessness. And how there's an answer to, and how there's something that can give us a rest, physically and actually spiritually. And the answer that the Bible gives us might kind of be a little surprise, and I pray that it is a challenge for us today. It may be challenged our thinking, and maybe what we've been taught or believed in the past, but as you'll see, it's just... This is just scripture, and it's going to be me hiding behind it. So, I think last week I, I was doing some narratives, and I kind of went back in time. And you got another one coming here, too. God, he, he created everything. God is the creator, and he was creating order from chaos. That's literally what God was doing. And on the seventh day, after everything was done, what did God do? We know the answer to this one. He... Rested, right? Rested, number seven, is key in the Bible. We're going to be, seven is going to come up a lot. And I hope it changes the way you view the number seven. But in seven, seven in the Bible, it talks about a wholeness. It talks about, it's a completeness, right? God rested. His work was done. He created order from chaos. However, right, Adam and Eve was living in that perfect rest. And then all of a sudden, a dark power came. A dark power that deceived him. And it disrupted, disrupted the rest that they had with creation. And now creation is broken. It's It was complete, but now it's it's broken. There's chaos now. And ever since then, we've become slaves to the land, slaves to work, slaves to each other. We, we spent our lives, it was, it was way back in the garden with Adam and Eve, they were the first ones, of trying to fight back this chaos with all their good hard work. But they're trying to fight back this chaos with no real rest. Years and years have passed, and God's people, right, were in Egypt. After God delivered his people from Egypt, it's like, he didn't say this, but not good theology, but God's like, okay, let's try this rest thing again. So, he wanted to give them a little a little taste of the, what that future rest was going to be like. So, he told them, all right, I'm going to tell you, on the seventh day, do nothing, right? This is going to be the Sabbath. Just keep the Sabbath holy, for I am holy. I think we kind of know that verse. See, the heart of the Sabbath was a day to enjoy God, enjoy His good world, to restore and replenish the people, the people, and the land. Well, the Israelites didn't stop there. They kept on that number seven going. And actually, every so the seventh day was the Sabbath, which the Jewish calendar is, I, I think we might know this, but that was actually the Saturday. It's, it's not Sunday. I mean, if, even now, if you look at your calendar, What's the first day of the week on the calendar? It's Sunday, right? Sunday is the eighth day. It's the start of the new week. So anyways, but this, it's okay. <laughs> you, you haven't got it wrong the whole time. Don't worry. But, right, for them, the, sab the Sabbath was the Saturday. But they didn't want to start on, end on the day. They said, okay, every seven years, we're going to have a very special day. And on this, every seven years, for that whole year, the Israelites, they, anyone that was a slave was now free. Anyone that had debt, debts were paid off and they were forgiven. The land was restored for that, and the, the land rested, even the farmers, for that whole year. That whole year was actually the Sabbath. Wow, this is going a little longer than I thought. <laughs> then the biggest 25, right, they even extended it. So now it's the seventh, every time that seven year period happened, the seventh time of that happening. So if you think about on the 49th year, they call that the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee, it's more or less the same thing, but all slaves were set free. All debts were cleared. All debts were cleared and forgiven. The land and the people were given this rest from their weariness and from their burdens. Like, everything was wiped clean. And all this is just pointing to a future rest. And many, and many years have passed. Israel's been doing this for a while. Many years have passed. And we kind of know the story how Israel kind of, they kept, they fell into some dark times, they kept disobeying God, and God had enough of it, but he, he didn't let them go, but he had enough of them, and he gave them over to their enemies, and said, okay, fine, if you think the grass is greener than the other side, sure, I'm going to give you away to your desires, but he didn't let go. 
Anyways, the Israelites, they got taken away, they were exiled, um, right? Looks like kind of all hope was lost, but God was still using the prophets at the time to speak truth and kind of they basically tell them that, God, I didn't forget about you. And some of the prophets stored uh, words from God to tell his people were lines like, there is a future jubilee that is coming. And for the Israelites, that meant, they knew what that meant, a future jubilee is coming. When I just think about this and the rest, I think the struggle is real. I think we could all probably say that. We live in a broken world, a chaotic world. Um, the struggle to just create order from chaos. I mean, where's the, uh, I lost him. He, uh, Keaton's, it's, okay, it's not Keaton's bridge, but the bridge he's working on. Just think about that. It's The whole point of that bridge, Third Crossing, is the traffic there is, is chaotic. And that bridge is to give order to the traffic flow. Uh, there's lots of moms here that have lots of kids. And I'll tell you what, you probably spent all day trying to put some order in your house and you got little minions running around disrupting that. <laughs> you wouldn't say they're chaotic, but well, maybe you would. But yeah, the little kids are there just destroying everything you're trying to do and you're trying to create order from their little chaos. Um, whether it's just raising kids, this wind is fun here. Whether it's raising kids, um, you have teenagers, Broken people do and say broken things. And for that, sometimes that makes our life chaotic. And sometimes we spend a whole lifetime to try to bring order to that. And that can be very tiresome. And that can weigh us down a lot. But then there's our world. Because our world will say, hey, just, just go to Disneyland. That solves everything. <laughs> Take a trip. Take a cruise. Spend some time, meditate, do some stretches, do some po uh, do some poses, worship this type of God, empty yourself and be open to his universe, and they're talking about different gods, don't do that, that's wrong, but the world is trying to give us answers. The world might say, hey, take this pill or do take this substance, do something that kind of gets you out of the reality you were never created to live in, but it puts you out of this reality so all of this worrisome and all your burdens, you'll never have to feel them ever, ever again. They might say, do this, and then, but then you got to keep up with this. Keep up with this. That's the way you're going to find rest. That's the way your worries and your burdens are going to be lifted. Our world's always trying to figure out a way to do things. Our world might justify someone saying, maybe he was, he was under so much stress, he fell in the blank. It was okay that he did that. Or she was so tired from work, she's allowed to have a little bit of fun, like, like, who cares? Deep down inside, there's a desire for rest in our souls. And what we need, and what we, what we need to desire, what we need to experience, is, our, is a personal jubilee. Are you following me so far? Have I, have I lost anyone? It's okay if I did. When Jesus first, so Jesus entered the scene, one of his first teachings um, was on the lines of something we're talking about. In Luke 4, I forgot to give you the verse. Um, I kind of wanted to give it a secret, but if you want, you probably might know where I'm going. But if you want to get your Bibles ready, I will get there eventually. And I did want to speak about probably four of these verses. It will probably just get to one today, so I might have to turn into a more a, a series another time. But we're going, we're going to be ending in, in Matthew 11, and uh, it's going to be probably verse 28. So anyways, Jesus entered his ministry, and the very first thing he teaches, and in Luke 4, 8-21, Jesus says this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he was anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And Jesus rolled up the scroll and handed it back to the attendant and sat down. He was doing this in the synagogue. Which, I made a guy go to school to, to know this, but I'm assuming this was probably on a, on a Saturday. Am I right, Dan? Maybe? Maybe go with it. Saturday is their Sabbath, but... 
Jesus was saying that, hey, you don't have to look any longer. The Lord's favor is here. Everything that the Jubilee is supposed to do, Jesus is saying, I am he. And how can Jesus say that he's the Jubilee? Um, well, Matthew 1.17, if you want to remember that verse, you can look at it later. But in Matthew 1.17, um, Matthew's going through all the, the genealogies before Christ. And you'll realize that Matthew says, I should have studied this one. Um, I'll just read it. So all those who are listed include, and then Matthew says this, 14 generations from Abraham to David. So 14, so two sevens. 14 from David to the Babylonian exile. That's another two sevens. And 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. That's six sevens. What does that make Jesus? The, seven, the beginning of the seventh seven. What is seven times seven? 49. Jesus is saying he is the Jubilee. He's literally the 49th. Gener he is the Jubilee. He's the one that's going to set the, the captives, the slaves free, clear all these debts, forgive every little thing. Jesus' mission was to restore, replenish, to mend the broken world that we live in. In Matthew, I think Matthew 8 to 10 is just some highlights of what Jesus does. Um, Jesus heals a leper, a leper person. Uh, there's a centurion who, whose faith, he, through his faith, his servant is healed. Um, there's a sick mother. There, Jesus overcomes these seas. Remember, Jesus is restoring this chaos, and he's making it, he's turning into order. He heals, he releases a demon in this man. He heals a paralyzed man, a dead girl, a sick woman, two blind men, mute man. What's Jesus doing here? He's bringing heaven down to earth. He's having people firsthand experience what a jubilee really, really feels like. He's giving rest for people physically. He's he's mending mending people's bones. He's physically doing it, and he's also giving them rest from their weariness, from the stresses in life, from their own sins. Right? Jesus is acting like the true jubilee. And then we're getting to our verse here. Um, remember, Jesus is he's, he's talking to the he's he speak his people, right? He's, he's talking to the Jews. He's challenging the Jews, people of Israel, and he's even talking to Gentiles. And and when when he says this verse, remember this kind of this challenged a lot of people, right? What's this jubilee about? Who's the Sabbath? Jesus is claiming that he is the Sabbath. He is the jubilee. And I, he probably. He probably rubbed, he, he did, he rubbed people the wrong way when he said this. But then we read the verse, but we're probably just going to, we're probably, we're just ending probably in the 20, 28th verse of this. Then Jesus said, this is NLT version, then Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He goes on to say, take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for my soul. My yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens. You notice that right, Jesus doesn't say, come to the Sabbath, right? Come to the synagogue once a day, and you'll get rest there. Jesus doesn't even say, okay, come to the Jubilee, or all of our festivals we have that year, and you'll experience rest. Jesus says, come to me, and you will have rest. I love that. I I want to. Pardon me. Sometimes I want to get so technical right now, and oh, I. Sometimes we just need to stand still and just and listen to that. Hear Jesus tell you, "Come to me, and you will have rest." I often think of the times in that. If you don't know the story, sorry. Um, if you don't know the Bible stories, um. I'll, yeah, I give, I'm giving no context, but there's a moment when there's this adulterous woman who sins, and people want to throw stones at her, and she kneels down, and, and basically Jesus is down there, and he rebukes the people that want to, to shun her and, and throw shame and guilt at her, and, and Jesus just writes something in the sand for her. Uh, we really don't know what it was. It was like a personal message. And I love that image about she was at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus was 
or it's just writing something personal deep down to her. Jesus is writing a message to her on, on the dirt, but it probably was a message in her heart. And when I think about these verses, when Jesus says, come to me, I often think about, man, I'm so busy that sometimes I don't listen, I don't hear those words because I'm busy. And Jesus right now is wanting all of us just to come to him because he will give us rest. And he can give us rest, and right away, I, I think, why could Jesus give us rest? And the way my mind works, and when I'm working on this, it's because, do you guys remember the garden, right? Jesus, right, the Son of God, the true Sabbath, his true Jubilee, in that moment, he experienced everything opposite of having rest. He was actually, he was very rest, restless. He was experiencing agony. He was experiencing the weight of carrying every little burden, because you probably could say, because he was He's carrying the sins of the world on his shoulders. Of course he's going to experience the heavy burdens. He actually was under so much restlessness and so much stress, he was actually sweating drops of blood. Now, I guess it's supposed to, that, that sweating drops of blood, hem, uh, hematohydrosis, something like that. It's actually a real disorder. And all that restlessness that he was carrying, he didn't deserve it. He actually didn't deserve anything of it. It was nothing that he did. He didn't put it upon himself. Sometimes our restlessness, our, our heavy burdens, we kind of put them on ourselves. It's a result of living, living under the curse of this chaotic world. We're trying so hard to, to make order, and we can't get any real rest. But Jesus voluntarily carried everything. He took on the curse of this chaos world. He felt the weight. He felt the reality of it. He stepped into the most extreme state of restlessness. It's so he, he did that so we wouldn't have to. It's so that we could now feel rest when we come to him. The price of our ultimate rest came at a cross. Came at a cost on a cross. But these sevens don't stop there. You think about the resurrection, and I think this is so ironic. But where was Jesus' body resting? Well, it was in a tomb. On what day? He was resting on the seventh day. And it rose again on the, on the on their Sunday, but the Sunday is like the eighth day. His body rose again on the eighth day. It's like a start of something new, of something fresh. There's hope now that we can actually have a real source of rest because the one right who carried all this restlessness, he died and rose again, and now when we come to him, we can have that rest, that rest that everyone wants, that rest that everyone is longing for. I honestly feel this is just so relevant to us today. Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I think about Jesus and just just kind of speaking to two groups of people in this time. I feel like he's he's easily t he's telling people like, okay, are you like are you really are you worn out? Are you burnt out? Are you tired? Are you carrying heavy burdens? Like honestly, Jesus is saying this. Are you feeling this right now? Are you burnt out on religion? He's like, just just come to me. Just come to me. It's that simple. And Jesus then would be talking to another group of people. And I, I, I view the Pharisees and sometimes I view the, Gen, the Jews and but sometimes I can kind of get in this mindset. And Jesus is, would, Jesus would challenge me with saying, Jordan, this rest doesn't just come once a week. This rest isn't just in the Sabbath. And I think Jesus would kind of wink here and say, it's, it's not really about the Sabbath because actually the Sabbath was, was given for men. It wasn't for men to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. Jesus says that in the Bible. Jesus is saying the Sabbath was actually a gift given to God's people. But the people in the Bible at times kind of wrapped that gift with a whole bunch of rules and regulations. And it kind of was like you got to follow these 39 rules back in this Bible time to, to, to live up to the Sabbath standards. And I can imagine Jesus saying, are you kidding me? My cross abolished all those little rules. You don't have to do this to the T on this certain day. You freely can come to me whenever you want. And my word promises when you do, when you come to me, you will experience something special. 
you will experience a rest like no one else can give you. But what I've learned, yeah. let me, before I kind of go into just something practical, um, let me just first start off by saying just some differences between religion and a relationship. Um, religion can kind of box God up, box Jesus up. We kind of can, religion can kind of confine God into a certain spot and put rules and regulations on him. And it's easy to think, hey, if I do this, if I do this, if I do this, if I just line up the whole stars, then he's going to honor me, he'll, he'll bless me if I just do this. And that's kind of religion. They, the religious person, and especially kind of the Pharisees back at the time, they didn't really want God. They kind of wanted the blessings of him. And if you think about the prodigal son story, I won't go into that, but the older, the elder son was kind of religious, right? He kind of wanted the father's, and, well, father's stuff. He really didn't want the father. Um, but when it comes to relationship, which, which we Christians believe, right? Think about a relationship. A relationship just simply enjoys someone, just enjoys their presence. Um, a relationship, you don't really, you don't need anything from that person. You're just happy with having that person in itself. You can kind of lose everything else, but if you saw that person, like, you're okay. Because that's what you came for. And if we have relationships, you know, well, I'd say this. When we have a relationship with Jesus, right, we enjoy Jesus for who he is. We don't need anything else. But also, a person that has a relationship with Jesus would just simply responds. A relationship just simply responds to what they do and what they say. And I would say this, one of the first steps, come to Jesus and he'll give you rest. If you have a relationship with Jesus, it was nothing you did to earn it. It was nothing you deserved. You simply have that relationship with him through faith. It's simply through faith. It's, it's, it's nothing else. It's not following certain rules, not following certain guidelines. It's just simply believing in him. Basically saying, okay, I, I can't be my own God. My good works can't save me. Okay, I need someone to... I'm broken. I can't do this on my own. I'm not the Savior of the world. You are Jesus. And through that faith, they become saved. My, when I, my heart and my challenge in this, I don't, I say things, I wouldn't tell someone something that I wasn't challenged with myself first, or confronted, or convicted. Um, and I'll be honest, I, I think sometimes we wrestle with this. I think sometimes we wrestle with coming to Jesus and this whole rest thing. Sometimes I think we might think it, we got to be all nice and pretty and tidied up, and it's only on certain days of the week. And um, I guess my heart is that, Sometimes I feel we get so busy in life doing task to task to task that we may say, well, I don't really have time to come to Jesus or, or just to come to this type of rest. There's so many things that I have to do and have to get done in my day. And I get convicted because sometimes I'm like, my first thought when I think about rest isn't coming and sitting at Jesus' feet. It might be taking a nap or watching a movie or... Doing things that may be okay, but that physical source of a physical rest can't give me what I spiritually need, a spiritual rest. And I think sometimes instead we need to be, okay, what if I just went around in, in my day, in my life, and I just, I really could have just, gee, the word says, if you come to me, Jesus says, if you come to me, I'll give you rest. I'll be your true Sabbath. I'll be your true, true belief. But sometimes with that, we should be almost like, okay, yeah, I can't wait to get this task done and that task done so I can come to Jesus and sit at his feet. Because I desperately need that. Because I know I'm weird, so I'm broken. And, and I kind of go to these other sources to kind of to give me a little temporary fix, but I know deep down inside, because I have a relationship with Jesus, I need to respond to his word, and I need to come and just sit at his feet. Because deep down inside, that's what my soul longs for. And deep down inside, I know it's what's in your soul, too. And I know we all know that, but vacations don't give you a deep rest because you still feel 
restless after them, or you still reality hits you. Jesus is calling him to, for us to sit at his feet. There's something, church, when there's something when we just kneel down. I was, I want to be on the grass, but there's there's something when we just we just go like this in our day. That's okay. I think it's I think the message is done. <laughs> there's something when we just sit down and kneel before Jesus. There's just something special happens. We're oh man. Where the gospel pierces this thing so deeply. And you hear the voices of the things you're wrestling with. Any shame, any guilt, any condemnation. He gives you rest. He liberates you from this place, from, from those ideas, from those thoughts. His, when you sit down and kneel before him, you're actually experiencing what the Sabbath was about. To enjoy, to delight the presence of God. And Jesus is saying, I am the Jubilee. I can give you that ultimate rest. Child, would you do that? Son and daughter, would you go before me and just hear that? Because when you do, the gospel will sink down so, so deep. You will have, free, you will have rest in so many different areas that I don't want to talk about. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the time now. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much. I thank you so much. You didn't come to abolish the law. You came to fulfill it. You fulfilled it through going to a cross and dying. But you didn't stay there. You rose again. And when you rose again, you started something new. You re when you rose again, you started something new. And you love inviting us into that new thing. See, our world is all stuck in the past. Our world is trying to figure out what, how can we, how can we give answers? How can we try to give people this rest? Oh, I, I know. We'll just send them away, do this, do that, do that. And Jesus is saying, no. What you really need, you don't need vacation time. You don't need this or that. What you really need is just to come sit down at my feet. I know you're busy. I know you got a lot of stuff going on. It's okay. You get them done. But after you get them done, I want your heart to say, man, I can't wait to sit at Jesus' feet. Because his Bible promises that when I do, there's something special about it. But when I sit at his feet, I will feel rest. I will understand that he actually lifted my burdens. The thing that I'm kind of stressed about, I understand Jesus has it all under control. All these burdens I'm feeling, if there's any shame or guilt in my life, I understand that the cross, that's what the cross was for. If the cross didn't cover all my sins, then what's the point of the cross? Jesus' death was worthless. No. His death covered everything. All of our sins. When we sit at your feet, we experience that. We feel that. And we hear those truths. And Jesus, you just want us to come and sit and rest at your feet. I thank you so much that you invite us to do that every day, anywhere, any place. Not a certain year, not a certain day or a month, but any time. We are free to do that. Amen.
close with this song, I just pray that you would just put these words in your heart and realize that they are true. Open arms, pray. 
set aside some time just to draw into your presence because that's what a relationship does. A relationship just enjoys the person for who they are. A relationship just wants to be with that person, not to get anything out of it. Simply enjoy them. And you got a great, amazing promise for us today. We learned you are the Sabbath. You are the ultimate Sabbath. The Sabbath all Sabbath points to. You're the Jubilee, the Jubilee of Jubilees. And when we come to you, you will teach us and you will show us how your yoke, your burden, it's light, it's easy. It's not rocket science following you. But we got to get there. And we're freely open to go there just as we are. At your feet, we can experience your love, your grace, your mercy, your guidance. So many good things in our life. And we need that. Thank you so much, Jesus. Amen. We're going to keep playing music a little bit longer if you want. If you want, you go back and get some food. If you feel like God's doing something in your heart right now, I would love to stay down here and chat. If you want to stay in your chairs, you're more than welcome. But we're going to play, we're just going to keep playing some music in the background. But other than that, you're, you're free to go. Hopefully it works this time. <laughs> 